Hello, and welcome to Local Legacies, the show where we go behind the scenes with enterprising individuals who are striving for the best in their business, family, community, and themselves. I'm your host, Tim Lanza, and without further ado, here's this week's guest. All right, everybody, welcome back. Uh, today in the studio, I've got what would be, I would say, our most requested or most recommended guests so far when I've told people, both guests and friends, that kind of what I'm doing here with this podcast, your name has come up probably a dozen times. So uh, I'll kind of let you introduce yourself a little bit. Welcome, Mark Bedanza. Sure. Thank you, Tim. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, obviously, we've spoken a little bit in preparation for this podcast, and uh, I like the ideas, and I like where you're going with it. And I think uh, hopefully I can offer something not only to your listeners, but something to the sort of platform that you want to develop along this way. It, it uh, does sound like an exciting project. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And I'm definitely glad to have you excited about it as well. That's great. Um, so you've got, as like you said, we talked about before, many different facets to your life. Um, you're a lawyer, a historian, you're involved with uh, the city itself. Why don't we start out w with your main job? You know, you're a trial lawyer, Bedanza and Bedanza Law. Talk a little bit about that. Sure. I've been a lawyer for nearly 40 years. It'll be 40 years exactly this December. Um, you know, I didn't develop uh, an interest um, or didn't commit to a legal career really until I was a freshman in college, and then it became a goal of mine. And, you know, I learned early on it was best to sort of separate that goal into attainable steps and moved along the, the path um, and had a successful legal law school career and um, started the practice of law on my own, um, sharing office space with a senior attorney who was very good to me and uh, unfortunately passed away uh, earlier this year. But, um, you know, I was attracted to the idea of um, being a small town lawyer. Um, before I embarked on my career here in Lemonster, I had an opportunity to work in New York City uh, for a Manhattan law firm. And although a lot of my classmates were very uh, enamored with that type of a potential career, I had to ask myself what I really wanted. And what I really wanted was to come back here. And I, I have no regrets that I did that. And um, I developed some fairly early success and I really enjoyed the uh, challenge of litigating, of you know, convincing a judge or a jury of the uh, facts um, you know, for your, on, the, on behalf of a client and uh, achieving a result. Always believed early on, too, not to oversell a client, that when a client had a case that was not a winner, um, not to proceed with it, uh, but to make the best out of what the facts were. Uh, whether it be a criminal case or a civil case, I think one of the things lawyers are really um, sometimes given a bad name for is to sell, sell sort of a fallacious view of what's going to happen with a case uh, for a fee. And I like to pride myself on never having done that, that if I think the case is a dog, I tell people it's a dog, and I tell them to make the best out of what the situation is rather than to pursue something that's going nowhere. I think you find that overlapping in a lot of different fields, but you know, for myself, it's like the, the used car salesman. Sure. It's like just like slap some paint on it and send it out the door. It's of course. Like that reputation spreads quickly. Exactly. And it will always come back to haunt you. Agree. Now you're in business with your brother. He's a partner, David. Yes. Yeah. Um, how did that come to be? Well, it's kind of an interesting story, actually. My I am a little older than David, and um, he uh, initially was trained as an optician. Um, saw that career as a bit of a dead end, and then he went to work in sales, and was that was worse. And his sales career lasted all of about a week, um, and I suggested to him that maybe he should go to law school. And he took me up on the suggestion, and it was a fortunate thing for both of us because, you know, it, was a, it turned out to be a, a great career choice for him. Uh, he was highly successful in law school. He graduated first in his class from New England Law School. And during his career, uh, both in school and then as a young lawyer, I was there, you know, giving him work uh, during the summers, during the weekends, during Fridays. Whenever he wasn't in school, he was working for me. 
So when he graduated, he knew the nuts and bolts. A lot of times people get out of law school and they know nothing about the nuts and bolts. They may know the theory, but they don't know the practicalities. And um, fortunately for me and fortunately for David as well, uh, he was well-trained and ready to roll as, you know, as soon as he got out of school, which, of course, was a great benefit to both of us. So that was more of like a, you know, the realities of it, like on-the-job right. training. Yeah. There's certain things they don't teach you in law school. Like every profession, whether it's an engineer, you know, whether it's being a doctor or whether, whatever it is, there's certain practicalities that you have to learn out there in the field. And, and the, the legal profession is like that as well. So did you know, you know, as he was going to law school and stuff, you were like, we're, we're going to, I don't know if you create or build a firm together. That, you know, that yeah, was always it, the plan. It was pretty evident from the beginning in, in our our sort of talents complement each other. I, I'm more of the sort of streetwise, strategic, sit back, how do we put this together? How do we take it apart best type of person? And he's he's very academic. And I could say to him, this problem has 13 steps. Here's the flow chart. And he would perform them flawlessly and put it all together for me. Awesome. And your, you know, I read a little bit on your website, uh, you know, your business website, it says, your clients are individuals, businesses, nonprofits. What exactly do your cases look like typically, or you know who's coming to you for your service? We, it, it's pretty broad, and you know I often think of how wonderful it would be to sort of like have one specific area in the law and be, you know, sort of uh, ultra involved in that. But you know I like the variety of what I do. I like being in court. I like litigating. Uh, there aren't a lot of litigators out there. Um, it's tiresome. It's uh, it's a lot of work. There's a lot of preparation to do it right, but the the results can be exciting and, and interesting and rewarding. And and people need that help. I mean, sometimes, and then you, there's the, the the sometimes the most difficult part of it is litigation can be so expensive, and negotiating a good resolution to avoid it can be sometimes as exhilarating as actually doing it, if that makes sense. Because I pride myself at being able to get people a really good deal uh, absent having to spend tens of, thousand dollars, tens of thousands of dollars to litigate that deal. Now, the cost of litigation comes from, like, essentially labor out time yeah, it's involved? Yeah, it's the only thing we sell. It's yeah, time, right. You know, so, and, and, it, and it ain't cheap. Right. And so you're basically doing as much of your homework or as much work up front as you can to go in – and have the deal on a platter. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I try to tell people what the limitations, every case has its limitations, and I try to tell people what the limitations are, what their strengths are, and what the proper strategy should be. And, of course, some of that is dictated by what the other side wants, uh, who's representing the other side. Some people are more reasonable than others. So there's a lot to it, a lot of moving parts, but it's, you know, you got to be quick on your feet. you got to be honest with people. And um, I find not only honest with your clients, but honest with the other side. Uh, it tends to work. And you, you were saying you, you like the variety. You, you're kind of a little bit broader with the right. cases you take in. It seems to be a recurring theme in your life. So yeah, I've taken that to other parts of my life. And, and you know, over the years, um, you know, I mean, it's not that I don't enjoy the law anymore, but, you know, any, anything you do for decades can sometimes become a little rote. And uh, although, you know, because I'm in the general practice of law, I've seen some crazy things, let me tell you, uh, that have kept it interesting. I also have branched out in other areas that have, you know, piqued my interest. And, and, and I think, you know, I'm blessed to have been able to do that. So as far as timeline-wise, I guess maybe we should go with what started to come in first throughout your law career, um, your involvement with the city council or with the, with the town itself. Yeah your involvement with your historical? Well, my first involvement with city government occurred in the late, uh, very late 80s, early 90s. I was city solicitor, which for people listening to that don't know what a city solicitor is. You're simply the attorney for the city. And that's a very broad practice of law as well. It deals with everything from creating ordinances to representing the city in court, um, advising the city council, the mayor, and, and all sorts of things. I happen to have a very unique uh, experience at that 
uh, because when I was city solicitor, we had the Pyramid Mall project being built, which was a 150-store mall uh, that never got built, but it was a huge illegal matter. Um, that was to be located basically where Walmart is today in that area of the town. We had three school additions that had gone sour, uh, largely because of the architect that was hired before I came on board to um, do the plans for the city. And last but not least, the city of Fitchburg was attempting to build an industrial park in the watershed of our principal reservoir, which is a no-town reservoir. And I pride myself, my brother and I, he was a, a big help to me in yeah. that. We were able to stop that project, able to get the local state senator to appropriate funds from the state to buy the land away from Fitchburg so that the land would never be developed and the reservoir would forever be protected, which I think was a really great achievement. Excellent. And you know, it's kind of just kind of laughing because like once again, it's like this broad spectrum mm. of work. And how did you how were you able to take that on? Or, you know, did you just kind of jump into it? It was a tremendous undertaking. And we could do a podcast just on that reservoir case. And it would, you know, it would it really would blow your mind as to I mean, we're talking about cloak and dagger. Um, people telling me things that didn't want to identify themselves about environmental studies that happened in connection with that. It was politics. I mean, the board of, you know, the, the uh, Chamber of Commerce getting involved in it is just crazy. And people said it had a, you know, Turkey Day mentality because it involved Lumberston and Fitchburg. And at the time, I thought, that's nuts. But, you know, looking back at it, it really isn't that crazy. So anyway, um, Dean Mazzarella got elected in 1993, and when you're the city solicitor, you sort of work for the mayor that's in power, and um, he hired his own attorneys, and that was that part of my life was done for a while, um, and I don't come back to city government until 2013 when the uh, local ward council in my ward convinces me to run for the city council, which I never thought in a million years I would do, um, but I thought about it, and I said, okay, well, I could try it for a term or two. Worst comes to worst, the terms are only two years, and that was seven years ago. Um, so in that period of time, I've been the finance chair. Um, now I'm the city council president. And there's some, been some fascinating things that we've gotten done, and I think the city of Lummis has been pretty highly successful in a lot of ways. Um, and I've been able to work with the mayor, um, who was a political adversary in the past, really well, which has been, you know, a great thing as well and on some great projects. And um, in addition to all of this, in 2009, I had this crazy notion that I'd play an antique football game on the Doyle pasture up on Lindell Avenue, which turned into a, I didn't even think they'd let me do it, but the trustees of reservations who were the steward of the land liked the idea, oddly enough. And it turned into like, uh, like planning a wedding. It was a $30,000 undertaking between uniforms and building the field and all the rest of it and made national, you know, websites. Uh, Fox Sports carried it on their national website. Uh, it was carried on all the Boston media. And we had two groups of semi-pro football players knock their brains out without equipment playing 1894 football. And I had to do a program because I don't think anybody would understand it. And I wanted to preserve not only uh, the rules of 1894 football, but I wanted to tell people a little bit about what that first game between Lemonster and Fitchburg was like and some of the other games after that. And I found so much material. And I'm sort of a nat natural born storyteller. And when I find stuff that I think is interesting, my first um, sort of desire is to share it with people. So I figured I'd write a book that would sell 100 copies to my family and friends, and that would be the end of it. But at least it would be a written record of what I found for people in the future or scholars or people who are just football fanatics. And the book ended up selling about 2,500 copies just in the local Barnes & Noble store, which had the district manager saying, who is this guy that wrote this book? And you know, I'd never had any dream that that would occur. That turned into another book when I reenacted the 1933 football game between Lemister and Fitchburg at Doyle Field in 2010, which happened to be the only time in the history of the rivalry that both teams met while undefeated uh, before Thanksgiving and met some fascinating people, people that played in those contests. Um, and it was really a tremendous blessing. 
in many ways. That book um, that went along with that game called 1933 Football at the Depth of the Great Depression was actually read by Bill Belichick, who sent me a long handwritten letter about it, uh, lauding it, and uh, he really enjoyed it because it reminded him of his dad. So then I wrote a book. Uh, then I ended up representing Jojo White as a client of the Celtic legend, which is a whole nother story. Um, and then I ended up writing his book. And very secretly while I was doing it, became not only very good friends with him, but wanted him to get in the Hall of Fame. And there's a thing called, there was a thing called the Jojo White threshold because so many people had written articles about the tragedy of him not being in the Hall of Fame and how you know, that persisted for so many years, 30 something years. And I secretly wanted the book to at least help. And finally he did get into the Hall of Fame in 2015 and Tommy Heinsohn, his coach, um, told me that the book got him in the Hall of Fame. Now, I don't know if that's true or it's not, but for Tommy Heidson to say it to me was quite a thing. And I, you know, since then, I've written six or seven other books, um, and I've written a couple more books that haven't been published yet. So the writing career sort of took off. Um, like I said, get back into local government, uh, became the chairman of the Board of Trustees of the Lumisdale Library, um, having been involved in the building project that created the addition, um, and have been active in another number of other civic organizations, including the Doyle Field Commission, uh, the Doyle Field Foundation, which is a private nonprofit, the Lumisdale Historical Society, which is a private nonprofit, um, and a whole b bunch of other stuff. So it's, it's been an interesting ride, let's say. Most definitely with some pretty impressive uh, events along the way. Yeah, I've been blessed. And you asked me a question off air about, you know, the value of history. And, you know, do we learn from history? Is it valuable to consider history? And some people take the position, well, it's in the past, it's not relevant. And other people take the position, well, we learn from history. And there's the famous quote, people who don't are deemed to repeat it. Um, I think a little more broadly about that. And what I think is that, you know, we all, whatever generation, you know, whether it was a generation four generations ago or whether it will be a generation four years hence from now, we all suffer the same sort of challenges and tragedies and travail. And we all benefit and celebrate the same joys, the same things make us tick. Yeah, the technology changes and the issues are a little different, but basically human nature doesn't change. And the way we approach problems, common problems, like might be how you raise your children, it might be how you educate your children, it might be how the United States of America deals with issues involving societal change or foreign countries and, um, you know, you know, warfare or disagreements or conflicts or the type of government we should have. All of those things have happened before and they will continue to happen. And when you know where you've been, it's easier to know where you're going. You know, right now, obviously the race uh, difficulties that have plagued this country since its founding are in the news because of recent events. And, you know, I, I say all the time and I notice that there's a public um, campaign out there now You've got to know the history of racial relations in America if you want to understand the solution to the problem. You cannot develop a solution to that problem without knowing the history. Thomas Jefferson wrote in the Declaration of Independence in the grievance section that the British had imposed the slave trade on America. That was a grievance. In the 18th century, people paid attention to the Declaration of Independence not for the preamble, which is what we focus on today. All men are created equal, blah, blah, blah. That's not what they cared about back then. They cared about the grievances. Today, all we care about is the preamble, and no one cares about the grievances. Well, the grievance that he was trying to say is they created this mess by bringing the slave trade to our colonies. That went from the document real quick because they needed the southern colonies to, to buy into this, and they weren't gonna buy into that. But what he was trying to say is, you people did this to us. And, you know, in a sense, he's true. He, he famously said slavery is like having a wolf by the ears. You can't let it go, and you can't hold on to it. And, um, you know, when you learn that sort of stuff, 
and you learn the sort of things that Thomas Jefferson talked about in the 18th century about slavery and blacks in general, it will make the hair on your back of your neck stand up. You wrote one book called Notes in the State of Virginia, and when I teach that to kids in high schools and tell them the truth about what Jefferson really believed, you know, it, it, it just blows their mind. Um, so when it comes to history, I am a huge advocate for telling it, understanding it, and then understanding also that we all suffer a certain mortality anxiety and you know, none of us want to die and all of us know we're going to die. I think when you understand what generations before went through and you understand what generations in the future will go through and that we're in this sort of human continuum and you understand where we fit in and what our contribution should be, it sort of dampens that anxiety a little bit because you know you're part of the human sort of condition in a long-term way and you know, I've learned a lot about that going along, and I think history is a huge sort of not only predictor of things, but also a way to um, make sense of your own life. In the last year or so, I feel like I've gained a better understanding or more of an appreciation for being able to take a step back and in the moment, you know, like this summer um, with their the things that were happening as far as protesting and things like that. And in that moment, it was very stressful. Obviously, I mean, still is to a lot of people very stressful. And it felt like there was just so much pressure, like it was about to explode. And it felt like this must be the worst things have ever been. Yeah. And then you can look back within the last 50 years and Not be like, well, we've already seen this. Yeah. You know, we've this is just repeating, repeating or. I don't know why this just popped to mind, but when there was the issue, when we were had tension with North Korea and uh, Hawaii got the false uh, report that there was an incoming right. uh, intercontinental, intercontinental ballistic, ballistic missile, missile. Uh, it's like, oh my God, you know, it's, it's, what could be worse than this? And it's like, the Cold War? Sure, you know, as, this, a, as a, you know, as a grade schooler in the early 60s, I remember the duck and cover and, you know, that the, the, there was a real threat of nuclear war that we grew up with in our generation. And, and there was a fear as a kid that I remember palpable fear about that. Um, yeah, it's happened. And it, you know, it doesn't make what's happening now any less grievous, but it has happened before. Um, good example, um, you know, one of the abolitionists that I studied and wrote about, the local lady, Frances Drake, you know, she was a... Um, abolitionist, but she was also somebody who championed gender and racial equality, which made her a prior in her own community because most abolitionists didn't believe in racial equality. They just wanted to end the political hypocrisy of counting a slave as three-fifths of a person for political power, but they didn't want anything to do with living with a slave or having a slave live in their neighborhood or a black person. Um, and she, of course, was fully capable of you know, living with a black person. They, someone asked her if she'd marry a black man. She said yes, if he had the appropriate qualifications. And she wrote to a friend in Boston, you have no idea how much talk this has caused around town. And here's one to get you that, to wrap your uh, head around that's a little difficult. In the 1850s, gender equality was more radical than freeing slaves. And even women were against gender equality. And I, thought, I think it makes this woman a powerful figure. And I've been on a crusade really since about 2007 or eight to make her known, you know, her, her, her example known. So there's so much stuff out there that you can focus on. What you're doing here um, with these podcasts, because we, when we talked a little bit earlier off the air um, in the direction you're going in, it reminds me of something that really piques my interest, and that is I am a huge fan of Benjamin Franklin. Everybody that listens to this, I don't care how old you are, especially but especially young people, I can't stress enough, read his autobiography. It is one of the most important books ever written. Um, it is entertaining. It is, it's, of course, 18th century prose, but it's fascinating, the prose itself. But more importantly, his ability to observe life and draw from those conclusions, those observations, is remarkable. The man is a genius. 
But one of the things he did when he first came to Philadelphia, escaping his brother's apprenticeship, was to create a junto, which was a group of young people that would, would get together. Um, there was a process where you had to join it. And one of your responsibilities was to bring something interesting to the junto. Whatever your passion or skill was, it was to bring it to the junto at a meeting and to discuss it and to inform the other members of the junto. And it was a tremendous improvement society where people would learn things. That, that, if that's part of where you want to go with this podcast, it, to me it's exciting because there are so many people with so many talents and passions out there. If we take the time to listen, you know, um, I mean, you can't but help improve what you, you know, your life generally and what you know. So, so not that this is about me, it's about you, but I'll yeah. tell you a quick story. You know, I lived, I graduated high school, I moved to Salem, I went yeah. to college up there, I lived there for seven years, uh, worked in the restaurant industry downtown, and I moved back here to take over my dad's business. Yeah. And I realized just the drastic shift of losing my community, like yeah. my tight community, the people that I had. And over the first like year or two, I think I changed a lot of who I was becoming, growing up, maturing, you know, I've got new goals. And part of my selfish interest of this is to either connect directly or kind of put a beacon out for other people who might be listening and might be interested. It's like, here's what I'm interested in and here's what I want to do with the next 30, 40, 50 years of my life. So how can I connect with the people that have those similar interests? And just already very early on, the relationships that I've began to create through this have been very powerful and it's really just exactly it's more than i honestly already more than what i could have hoped for that's great i'll tell you this um i learned a, a powerful lesson from one of the people i wrote about which was jojo white and a supremely talented gifted athlete but in many ways and you'll hear this about many highly competitive competent star athletes are pretty good people you know, it's very hard to be, you know, a lousy person and a great athlete. I mean, it can happen, but it doesn't happen that much. A lot of the greatest athletes are good people. And that certainly Jojo White could be argued to be a better person or, than, a, than a player. Uh, and he was a great player. But what he taught me, um, which I sort of probably already known or didn't know, but he, what he brought home to me, something that was, of course, intuitive maybe earlier, was that, you know, you are given a set of God given talents, right? But they're not yours to keep. That's what he used to say. You have a responsibility to share the time and talent with other people, especially the ones coming up, the young people. And he used to do this thing with his hands. He would say, the only problem is the more I try, I try to get rid of them, he says, the more they come back. And what he was talking about is love. When you share your, your gifts your time, your talent, your passions with other people, what comes back to you is love. And that is the true and only way to contentment. You mean, somebody could give you a car. Somebody could give you a vacation. That's pleasure. And it will not sustain long-term happiness. But the, those sort of things, developing strong relationships with people, especially ones born in the sharing of passion, time, and talents, are what life is all about. And you're someone who I w would assume has had that come back to you 10 or maybe 100 fold I, I with mean, everything you've put out. I couldn't feel more blessed. I, I've had so many you know, wonderful people um, help me, mentor me, um, contribute. Um, you know, and it's funny. I learned early on the power of letter writing to be, you know, to demonstrate in a tangible way of thankfulness. I remember, I'll never forget, I met, we were talking about the power of social media. I met Maria Stefanos, the anchor of WCVB TV, um, when she was at Fox via Twitter. And she was so nice. And she tried to arrange a morning um, segment with, for my book with Jojo White. And she hooked me up with all the producers, told me what to do. And, you know, it's a lot of, there's a lot of competition for content on regional television like that. And they just, the producers just never went for it. So I sent her a letter because I knew she 
genuinely tried. I sent her a handwritten letter and a copy of the book, and I said, thank you very much, Maria. It was really kind of you to, to help me. She sent me a, a direct message on uh, Twitter one night uh, near the end of her uh, broadcast. I said, are you still up? I said, yeah. She goes, I got your letter. It made me cry. She says, um, Kristen Leahy, who at the time was the sportscaster on Fox, is going to call you in a few minutes. So short to her word, Kristen Leahy called me and said, Mark, I'd like you to, what are you doing tomorrow night? I says, what do you want? You want me, you want me into the station? She says, yeah, I want you and JoJo to come in and do like a 10-minute segment on my sportscast. Next thing you know, Wednesday night, the next night we were in Boston doing 10 minutes on regional forecast because, broadcast rather, because I really, I sent the letter and I had no ulterior motive. I just wanted to thank the woman, but it touched her. And um, I tell young people all the time, never underestimate the power of thank you, especially in a written form. Um, we don't write enough letters. And when you, you know, I always loved the 18th century for the power of the letter writing. Some, some of those people could write tremendous you know, prose in letters. And I love reading them to this day. And I sort of tried to emulate that. And I think when you do, you set yourself apart. You really do. I think that also kind of people underestimate the power, like you said, of just of thank you or telling somebody how you feel and right. being able to really express that. I think, you know, with relationships, whether it be a romantic relationship or a friendship, something I try to do is just say when I'm thinking something. Yeah. You know, if somebody just does something simple and you like it, yeah. tell them and tell them how it made you feel. And they're going to probably continue to do that because now you've made them aware. Sure. You know, whereas most people are kind of just drifting through life and might just let that pass. And then it's like, well, why, how come they never do that anymore? How come they, you know, they haven't repeated that action? It's like, did you tell them what it meant to you when you right. when it first happened? Some of the most successful people have really um, made a practice of that. W one of the sports books I read um, was about Lamar Hunt, who was a, obviously a highly successful Texan. And he, when he met somebody, you know, of any consequence or any, or any, not the person of consequence, but a thing that was consequential. He wrote a letter to every single person he ever met. And, you know, the guy obviously was a tremendously successful businessman. Now, as far as helping people, I, I kind of want to go back to when, you know, you said you had a conversation about getting involved with the, with your ward, the city council. What did that conversation look like and what made you decide, like, this is something you wanted to pursue? The uh, incumbent uh, ward counselor was m moving up to spend one more term as a counselor, but as an enlarged counselor. And he was vacating his seat. And, he, and, you know, when you're worked hard for the city, you want to make sure whoever inherits your seat is going to do a good job. And, and he, you know, flattering that he would think that I would do a good job. And I, his name was Bob Savatelli, and I, I respect Bob a lot um, in, in a multi multiple ways. And, um, you know, I, at first I was sort of, eh, I don't think so, Bob. But then I thought about it, and I said, you know what, I'll try it. And, um, you know, and I don't regret for a minute that I did. Some days I do, because it can be one of those thankless tasks at times. But it is important. Um, the work that we do um, for the city is very important, and it takes, you know, a lot of effort sometimes, and it takes a lot of um, sort of sticking to task. But in the end, you know, we've created some great um, progress here in this city. Um, the city is well well funded, well managed financially. I mean, we're the only community in the state that has a fully funded pension, which will save taxpayers literally tens of millions of dollars over the ensuing years. Uh, we have a pretty vibrant, clean downtown. And we're not perfect. I mean, no community is. But um, I think, you know, as a city government, we work pretty well together. Um, there's always room for improvement. And, you know, that's the way you have to look at it. Uh, you can't rest on laurels. But you, 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 sometimes you got to take a step back and appreciate what you've accomplished, too. So... It's been that. I don't, you know, how long I'll do it, I don't know. But, you know, maybe till people get sick of me or whatever. But um, it is, uh, it's a, you know, it's a task. And, it, and it's a task I take seriously. And I, 
I try to do the right thing. Some of it's very simple constituent service. People have problems and they have difficulty getting, you know, the proper attention for those problems. And it, it's always rewarding to be able to help somebody out and get a problem solved. So, well, you spoke earlier of contribute. You know, it's your kind of your duty to contribute your talents and contribute that mm-hmm. to other people. And I think that's a very direct way of doing that. What you've done with the city council and what you've done in the city of Lemonster. You know, I couldn't have a more, uh, you know, direct impact on your community. Yeah, no, it's, it, it is, I mean, it is a giving back. Um, and it, it does take a, it's, it's, you know, it's not a full-time job, but it's a, a little bit more than a part-time job. Um, if you, if you do it to the level that you should do it. Yeah. Now, earlier you were kind of alluded to your book. She took a stand. you Hmm. Why don't we talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, it was my it's my first attempt at a children's book, and it, you know, although it's a lot, you know, fewer words, and it's a lot, there's more illustrations than uh, than a, my, one of my adult books. It was a challenge. I mean, it's you know, finding the right prose. Um, I happen to have a cousin that teaches that grade level uh, who was took it on as a project with her class, which was really cool. Uh, it was a way for us to bond. Uh, but I wanted to bring the idea of Mrs. Drake to younger people because I think her, her lesson, her example of moral courage, you know, what she did back then wasn't, today, you know, she would be lauded as a hero, but back then she was a pariah. And she had to exercise a lot of moral courage to push gender and racial equality in the 1850s. And I, I want the kids to know that. Last year, when the early throes of the pandemic, I posted on Facebook about her home that the city's purchased and preserved that a great activity for parents would be to take their younger children there, stand them in front of the place, and tell them the story of what happened there, that she helped rescue the first fugitive slave caught under the compromise of 1850s new fugitive slave law, which made it um, a thousand dollar fine to assist the fugitive slave, which was about half the value of a house back then, took the, um, any fugitive caught, took the question of whether they would be held or released away from a Massachusetts court and gave it to a federal commissioner who got paid $10 to send the slave back to slavery and $5 to free the slave. Um, And the first person they caught, um, a group of free blacks broke into the Boston courthouse and broke that person out and brought them first to Dorchester and then to Concord and then to Lemonster. And she helped that slave um, get to Canada. And uh, it's a tremendous piece of, of history. Drew the rebuke of the President of the United States for her activities, along with the others who helped. And I said, bring your kid. Stand them there in front of the house and tell them what happened there. And to me, it's a powerful lesson. And that post got 167 shares, not likes, shares. Um, I plan to do uh, a Juneteenth um, event there where I'll be present explaining um, the history of the house and especially geared towards, I hope, young people. And I've had a couple of generous donors step up and We'll be giving away um, some copies of those books to students that sh- the first students that show up. Where do you think that comes from? That courage of obviously you've studied her at length, like in like you said she was a pariah of her time. Where does that come from in in a human well, being? It, I kind of draw a, a parallel between her and Harriet Beecher Stowe. Harriet Beecher Stowe, of course, wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin. And if you read about her life, what you'll learn is she lost a son at a very young age. And when she buried her son, she said, I felt or understood better what it happens when uh, a young child is taken away from a slave mother. Um, and Mrs. Drake, at, um, as a teenager really, lost her, uh, her younger sister her infant brother and her mother all within six months and became the matriarch of the family as the oldest child. I have to believe that that changed her forever and that she understood, again, like Harriet Beecher Stowe did, how you know awful the practice 
you know, the, the, the institution of slavery was, because, it, you know, it's just not a question of bondage, it's a question of, you know, torture, of, of, let's call it what it was, rape, uh, the tearing apart of families. I mean, it was heinous. And, you know, she just wanted to bring that to an end any way she could. And I think her sensitivities as a young woman learning her own pain it was a way for her to deal with it. It's hard almost, it's like you said, we, we're in a place now where that seems obvious. Mm. And it's hard to imagine what it was like back then, kind of going out on a limb and taking a, a drastically, drastically different viewpoint or stance than what other people were at the time. Sure. And don't forget, a lot of Northerners profited off of slavery. Not all the profit came from the South. There were Northern businesses, you know, insurance companies that insured freight, freight companies that shipped cotton, the mills in the North, the banks that financed it all. Those are all Northern companies. And they, they didn't want slavery to end. And they didn't want the Union to dissolve. That's what the Compromise of 1850 was all about, was to prevent the dissolution of the Union. Ironically, it had the opposite effect. It hastened the Civil War. Mrs. Drake and others like her, who were the more radical abolitionists, said, this problem will never be solved but for blood. It's going to take a radical, you know, unfortunate situation to solve the problem. And she was right. I mean, the Civil War had to happen. With your books that are coming along now, or you've got a couple in the works, are you hoping to do more children's books? Or where, where do you see this going as far I don't, as... I don't know if I'll write another children's book, honestly. I, my books are... This is, it's, I, I liken it to an incubator. There's a bunch of, like, ideas floating around in this incubator. And, you know, they're, like, in a cauldron, and they're stirring, and then one sort of pops up to the top, and I take a look at it and say, commit to that. And that becomes the project. So... During the pandemic, I wrote or finished the children's book, wrote a book about um, a friend of mine who was um, hijacked on a plane in 1987 coming from Athens, Greece to Rome, uh, destined for Boston and became a hostage for 17 days on that, on, in the Middle East as a result. And the story is harrowing and fascinating and it's, it's crazy. And I didn't. I never knew the details of his story. I knew that the broad outline of what had happened, but it's a great, great story. And he was instrumental in doing some good things um, to help uh, release some of the hostages. Um, and fortunately, for the most part, the story it didn't. And Robert Steedham, you know, a, um, a Navy diver, was murdered in that uh, hostage taking hijacking. Um, but the rest of them made it home. Um, so that book will be out in a couple months. And then um, I wrote a book about Lou Little, who was a Lummiston native and tremendous uh, influence on college football in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Uh, never realized how deep of an influence he really was and a tremendous human being because he cared really more about the student athlete than about winning. Uh, don't get me wrong. He won some crucial games, and he was a he was a very valuable and respected coach. But he cared about people, and that really struck me the way he did. And it, it gives us a certain amount of pride that he's from Lemister, and his story is buried. Nobody's, I mean, and it's funny. Even the university he coached for, uh, the universities Georgetown and Columbia, have so much of his story wrong. I mean, bastions of academia, and they don't even have his birthday correct his place of birth correct. There's so much in the story that's missing. And I've talked to the, some officials at both schools, and I said, I'm going to fix all this for you and get the story straight. And he, I mean, he was a, a TV personality. He did Jack Parr, and he did Jack Benny, and he did uh, Edwin Murray's show. Um, it, it was, you know, he was a dude back in those days. So I want to bring that story home, too. Now, I... I am just like personally extremely impressed with it's, you kind of went out on a limb and wrote your first book or decided this is something you're going to pursue. And obviously one after another, after another, you've diversified your life in such a way. It seems like you just find something you're interested in and then go after it. How, how has that affected your life as you've gotten older, as you've taken on more projects? How are you able to balance all of it? It's made me a happier person, honestly. 
And I, like I said, I, I think I give meaning to my life um, with all of this work and all of these passions and what I give back to the community uh, in turn. And, you know, we all, you know, when I wrote the history of Lemister book, which was back in 19, I, it's the only narrative history of Lemister that's ever been written. And I was in a bookstore looking for a project because it was November and I like to write when it's cold. And I didn't have a project in mind and then I was looking at all these books and people, I remember when we built the addition to the library, people said, hey, what are you building a big addition for? Books are out of style. You know now there are, there are three times many books published now than there were like 20 years ago. And you go into a Barnes and Noble and look around and you see all these books and you say, why do people write all these books, right? Why are they writing them? Well, obvious answer, to inform, to educate, you know, to entertain. There's another reason. People are writing for a legacy. I mean, it's a pretty permanent record in some ways. And I have to admit, I do the same. I mean, I'm creating a legacy. I mean, people, long after I'm gone, are going to pick up some of these books and read them. And, you know, and, and hopefully they'll take whatever I did another step, maybe. And, and um, maybe I left a, a blueprint for them. And that, that's important to me, too. So I, I think that's, you know, I feel very fortunate to have sort of discovered this, albeit by accident, and uh, it's a big part of my life. I, I don't know how many books I'll end up writing. I may never write another one after the Lou Little book. I don't know. I just take it sort of a step at a time and do my best and, uh, and um, I'm enjoying it. Where does your passion and interest for Lemonster, for history, sports history, you know, where do you think this comes from? Obviously, you've you've pursued it heavily. I I think football is a very unique game, and it's a quintessential American game. And there's an argument to be made. Um, I actually even put the course syllabus together for this that football formed America, because the sport of football replaced warfare for our young men in the 1890s, because they had no wars to fight in, so to speak, and they had to prove their strength, metal, and you know their courage someplace. So the football field became it. And everybody worth their salt had to be a football player. And college football players were like rock stars back then. So that's, I think football is so unique in so many ways because of that. And it reflects the violence of American culture. It reflects the teamwork of American culture. It reflects the idea that an undergunned, out, out underskilled, uh, outsized group of people can beat someone who's better than them physically by genius which goes right back to the notion of George Washington beating the British through genius, not by brute strength. It's a game it's of a, inches. It's an American concept, and we love underdogs, and that's football. So there's that, but you know, also there, in, in Lemister, of course, is a big football heritage town, and we have this you know, wonderful rivalry tradition. But Lemister is a unique place uh, historically and in so many ways. And I'm trying to prove that with the documentary we're doing. Um, well, since you brought that up, that's perfect, actually. Why don't we talk a little bit about yeah. that? But before I get to that, just to finish, um, I actually have been approached by a, a really renowned author who's a Lemista native to assist her in writing an article that had already been actually okayed by her editor at The New Yorker about Lemista, Massachusetts, if you can believe that. So... The documentary is called Nation Rising. It's a five part. We've produced two. We're in the process of producing a third episode of Lemister history from the perspective of its impact on the nation and the nation's impact on Lemister. You know, um, everything from, you know, Johnny Appleseed to Francis Drake and everything in between. Lemister people had impacts on local history and uh, local history has had impacts on Lemister. And we're trying to give people a honest approach to the historical story. Every age reinterprets the story, right? History is not static. To think that history is written and that's it, no. It's dynamic. You know, what we said about Thomas Jefferson 50 years ago is far different than what we say today. You know, 50 years ago, no one knew that Jefferson had an affair with a slave, okay? Today, most people know that. A lot of people don't know that the slave was his wife's half-sister, and she looked just like her. And he had promised his wife when she died he would never remarry, so this was a pretty convenient relationship for him. You know, So there's a lot to this story, and it gets deeper than that. But you know, 
every age looks at the story a little differently. And I'm looking at Lemister history differently. The Lemister people early on took a pride that they bought the land from the natives. Yeah, they paid, in essence, what was the value of three cows for 50 square miles. So you bought it, really? <laughs> you know? So I wanted to tell people, you know, well, you know, in 1852, when David Wilder wrote A comp Compartmentalized History of Lemister, which is a great book that I use for a source all the time. And while they took great pride in the idea that they bought the land instead of took it from the Indians, I think I've told a more accurate story about how they got the land. And that's kind of the, the point that I'm trying to go with it. And I, and I think when you tell people the truth, it's the same as a jury trial, Tim. When you tell people the truth, they know it. When they get in snowed, they know it. And when I tell a story historically, if I'm telling the truth, it's, it's entertaining and people can see it. So, and I try to write with a style that's accessible for people. I don't try to impress people with the, you know, my vocabulary. I try to make the, the thing flow and readable. And I've, a lot of people have said that. You had a, a friendly sort of, you know, writing uh, prose and uh, people seem to like it. So. If they like it, I'm glad because I've had when people come to, to me and tell me that they are entertained, uh, or even better, that their kid read the book and their kid was entertained. That that's all I want to hear. That's what it's all about. Well, and obviously that can be found in your books, any one of them. If someone wants to get involved in reading them, if there's a subject they're interested in, but there's countless, countless examples. If anyone would want to go to your Facebook page, um, you post pretty regularly yeah. different. Uh, I don't want to say facts because it's usually quite extensive, quite a bit of information on specific yeah. subjects, whether it's date relevant or uh, certain topics that are relevant. So why do you do that? I mean, I think I've got a pretty good idea, but talk yeah. a little bit about that. Well, it's, 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 it's multi-purposed. I mean, part of, the, part of the reason I do it, of course, is to inform. Um, I find this stuff fascinating, and I think other people would. People like their local story. There are people that will have no interest in the historical, you know, history of America or the iconic, or the history of the founders, the, I, the icons, largely because a lot of it when they were in school was BS. It wasn't true. And, and again, people can see it and they smell it. But when you talk about their local story and they can see something or touch something or go, hey, that happened over here or that happened there, or I knew who that person was, you know, the Patriots organization is in part related to Lemister because Jonathan Kraft's father-in-law, which where all this money came from, you know, started his career in Lemister, um, which uh, when I post about that, people love it because it's, they can, they can even see where it, where it happened. So that's important. And then, you know, quite honestly, to be candid, it's, it's branding for me. You know, it, it develops a little bit of who I am and um, in a wholesome way. I, I like to use social media is like fire. It can be very destructive and it can also be very wholesome and, and uplifting for people. And I think if you can uplift people, then you've done something good. Most definitely. And you do a great job of kind of taking a, you know, a bite-sized chunk and feeding it off to people. It's, it's funny. Sometimes you can you know, post a photograph and put three sentences and you'll get a lot of attention for it. And then sometimes you can post a photograph and, you know, six, six or seven or eight paragraphs, which is a long Facebook post. I've been surprised by how many people will read those uh, because people generally on social media aren't looking to read, you know, a little dissertation. They're looking for a, you know, a quick hit because it's the nature of the beast, right? But so I kind of mix it. I do both. Um, and I'm, it's not, you know, I'm not looking for, I don't need 600 likes. I just want a few people to enjoy, you know, what I've posted. I think it shows pretty clearly that you are just looking to provide value for other people. And then as your life has evolved, as your multiple different careers have evolved, that has come back to you, you know, that you look at, you're basically writing the books in, in my eyes, just for your own self-interest or your own, or I shouldn't say self-interest, I guess, but personal interest yeah, in the subject matter. True. And then all of a sudden there's a market for it. And now you're actually building out a market by creating value right. for the consumer. Yeah, that's, 
you know, it's all sort of tied together. Um, and, you know, it's, it's worked. It's been a lot of fun. Um, I don't know what's next. I mean, the documentary was, uh, you know, a good idea. I mean, the local people, our local access television station is so talented. And I went to school with those guys. And to have their, um, you know, um, involvement in this is really a boon. My brother's narrating it. He's very talented. He's also a pastor as well as a lawyer and, you know, is a talented speaker. And it's just a great team we've put together, um, you know, and, and uh, it's, it, I just thought it was a natural thing to do. And I mean, who knows what's next? You know, I mean, um, something will come along. And I told you off uh, air, you know, I, I'm going to have a discussion tomorrow morning with one of the anchors from WMUR TV um, about a documentary she's working on because she saw mine. And I happen to have the benefit of meeting her because she's an author as well. And saying, when, when could I have imagined that, you know, the anchor of a television station for the state of New Hampshire would call me about making a documentary? So you can't, you can't make that kind of stuff up, you know? Well, once again, providing that value combined with you taking that step, just saying, I want to do this. And yeah. now all of a sudden you're yeah. a source for others. Yeah. It's, and, and, you know, and she's a great lady. I, I've been friends with her now for three or four years. And, and it's, you know, she... We just have a great friendship, you know, so it's been cool. With all of the research, writing, um, information you have on the history of Lemonster, I figure what better person to ask, and something I'm personally interested in is where is Lemonster going as a city? What's next, and what do you see in the next 10 to 20, 30 years? Well, it's an interesting thought. Um, most of our land area has been developed, you know, residential land area has been developed. I mean, the policy in Lemonster for many years was to buy up, um, you know, conservation land to protect the watershed. And most of my ward, Ward 4, half of it is in some kind of protection, which I think was forward thinking. So, you know, I think, you know, re real estate values will continue to rise, not just because of what's going on in the market now, but because of where, you know, not that far from Boston and, you know, the gentrification seems to be, it has been for many decades coming west. Um, I remember when I started driving to Boston as a young lawyer, you, you wouldn't hit traffic till Concord. Now the traffic from here to Concord is worse than Concord to Boston. So I, I see a certain trend with that, you know, uh, the community community's uh, value in terms of real estate value will probably increase over time. I think uh, hopefully we'll get a bigger share of, you know, good industry here. Um, you know, we're in a throes of a big change between going from, you know, consumerism from bricks and mortar consumerism to internet consumerism and how, what, how the malls will get redeveloped is a big issue going forward. Um, you know, hopefully we'll continue to work on and improve our educational system on a local level. Um, there's, you know, there's work to be done. Uh, but I think we have a lot of things going for ourselves as a community, and I think we're a desirable community. Um, and we continue to become more desirable as time goes on. And we're financially, we're in good shape. Um, you know, our, our infrastructure is in pretty good shape. Again, there's things that need to be done. As a ward council, we hear all about the streets all the time. Um, and I've worked hard to get streets accepted and paved, and that's a big effort. Um, in fact, the guy that got me to run said I'd never get a street accepted. Well, I think I'm going on five now. So I took it as a personal challenge. Um, and he told me I wouldn't get the name of a school change, so I did that too. Uh, another personal challenge, but um, I th I'm I'm optimistic for Lemister, and you know, young people like yourself getting involved in a project like this only underscores for me that the, the city has a bright future. With that being said, what do you think needs to happen to get more young people involved? Because I think that's a, a fear, especially of the older generation and the, you know, the more older people that I speak with, it's like, oh, the young people don't care. And like, these things are important, whether it be uh, historical buildings or conservation land environmentally. Young people care, they just care in a different way. You know, they might not be joining the Elks Club or they may not be joining the Eagles, okay, but they care. And you know, I think developing 
new organizations that maybe are more eccentric to you know what technologies younger folks have been brought up with. Um, that idea that I floated about, you know, literally forming a junto, uh, I think is, it would be a brilliant thing for young people to do, um, and it would be great networking, uh, which is, you know, well, candidly, that's why a lot of these fraternal organizations existed over the years. I mean, back when we opened the time capsule in 2015 and pulled that out of the, after 100 years out of City Hall, I mean, most of the stuff in there was from fraternal organizations. There were scores of them back then. Of course, people didn't have TV. They didn't have movies. You know, they, they had to entertain themselves in that way. So those sorts of things that are adaptable to sort of the more modern approach, I think, would be great for young people to get involved in. Um, you know, causes. I mean, charitable causes are always, you know, in foundations and different things. But, you know, I, I think the future is bright. I really do. I'm an optimist at, at heart, and I think there's a lot of people that want to do a lot of good things. And, you know, we all have a season in life. I mean, you know, when you get, when you're in your 20s and 30s, a lot of it's like, okay, I got to survive. I got to get a career. I got to raise my children. I got to have a, you know, a, a find a spouse or find the person I want a companion, be a companion with for the rest of my life. But, you know, when you hit 40, things start changing a little bit too. So it's, you know, it's, generational too of where you are at where you're at at that particular time but you know i mean we're always look at we're always going to change that's the only constant change and i was in college i took a logic course in the book which copyright 78 said there would be more ch technological change between the time that book was written in the year 2000 and there wasn't all in recorded history before and i'm sure that came true and that'll change is exponential and, um, you know, the challenge sometimes is to keep up with it and adapt to it. And, you know, a lot of it is very beneficial and some of it not so much. But that's always true. You know, from the minute they invented the streetcar, people were getting run over by them. You know, um, or electricity, people were getting electrocuted or burning their houses down. So there's always a yin and a yang. And, you know, we got to do the best we can to find the, the benefits and to improve on whatever we're suffering from. Excellent. Well, I think I, you know, I think you and I could probably talk, continue to talk for hours, and I'd love to have you back on to talk about some more sure. different things. Anytime, I want to be respectful of your time, thank but you. I also just want to thank you for all of the work you've put into this. You know, your writing, your teaching, your work with the city, your professional work. You know, it's greatly appreciated. Obviously, I'm sure you're aware of that. And well, uh, I appreciate you know that notion, and thank you for having me, and uh, thank you for doing this. I mean, this is a great thing. Thank you. I'm yeah. excited about it and uh, yeah. excited to have you back. Okay. I'd love to do it. Excellent. All right. Excellent. Thank you for tuning in with us. We do this to share the stories of some of the incredible individuals in your community. All we ask in return is if you found value from this episode, please share it with someone else who may also gain value from the show. Please feel free to rate or review the show. Your feedback helps us give you more of what you want. Until next time, I'm Tim Lanza, and this was another Local Legacy.